everybody, come on in and take your seats. We got plenty of chairs up in the front. Like they said, this is not church. This is gonna be something, uh, but this will be perhaps a religious experience. Um, I don't know. So I'm just gonna get going to keep us on time. Uh, my name's Danielle Robinson, and I'm one of the co-executive directors of Code for Science and Society. Over the last year, we've been working with the support of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and California Digital Libraries UC3 Curation Center, which was, we will talk a lot about some, about the work of CDL in this talk too, on a project to level, to, ugh, excuse me, on a project to leverage decentralized tools to automate data breast practices and scientific workflows. Out of this project, we began with new collaborators, Internet Archive and San Diego Supercomputer Center, we began to build a prototype for a decentralized scholarly information sharing network perhaps a new decentralized scholarly commons. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in this talk. First, a tiny bit about Code for Science and Society. We support open source in the public interest, and well, we support a bunch of open source software projects, some of which you may have heard of, some of which we'll be speaking tomorrow. Hey, uh, go see Daniela, Daniela Sideri's talk. Uh, we support them with fiscal sponsorship, strategic support, financial administration, partnerships, strategy, and more. It's a fun community. Y'all should come to our community calls. So, as many of you may agree, or not, we'll find out, um, a lot of today's digital infrastructure is in conflict of the, with the values of communities that work in the public interest. Because we work with the DAT project, DAT is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocol. So a lot of people, activists, artists, civic technologists are using DAT to rethink how information is shared in communities. It's being used by people who are exper experimenting with what a values-driven web would look like. And we see this happening in these other communities and we see parallels between the issues facing the larger internet freedom movement and the scholarly communications ecosystem. So to sort of summarize, what would it look like to build digital infrastructure that centers the values of researchers, scholars, librarians, scientists, and the folks that we work with, the folks in this room? And can we build it today with the top technology that exists? So we're gonna explore. Um, to start with, I wanna say that I view the internet, the web, as today's scholarly commons. It is a commons, and Un, and like a commons, sort of whether we like it or not, we don't get to say, well, actually, the scholarly commons should live here, because it is the internet, the whole internet. Data from the humanities, civic data, newspaper data, your personal data, scholarship and research, all of these things are now web accessible objects that are stored online. And as a commons, the information on the web is deposited there with varying degrees of strategy, management plans, and plans for long-term upkeep. Increasingly, all of this is political, as we saw during data rescue, and increasingly, all of this is uh, monetizable. It's a, it's a business opportunity, and some would say personal and public interest data is being monetized and weaponized to the detriment of the communities that need it. Data is more valuable than it has ever been before, and data, data ownership is more contentious. But the stewardship, the broad stewardship of data and scholarly data is uh, not entirely standardized. Everything that's on the internet is handled by the web as data. We're all familiar with the failings and issues of working with mega platforms. Um, our data is their business. Uh, we give our data, I made these slides in Google Slides. I am not always eating my own dog food. Um, <laughs> so we... things can be turned around and monetized and packaged and sold back to us. Our privacy may be violated. And um, a similar thing is happening in scholarship with corporations and other stakeholders competing for the ownership and right to distribute scholarly information. And when I say scholarly information or data here, I'm talking about the whole thing, publications, data, software, the entire package. Uh, yeah, again, our data is their business. And a lot of this is possible because of the way the web was designed. Massive centralization is a natural progression to the way the early web was designed and the way it's been built over the last 20 years. But there are key flaws in this design that many communities are trying to find workarounds for, and that's where the decentralized web community comes in. 
Today's web lacks persistent identifiers. Without persistent identifiers, we visit a URL and we hope that the thing that we want is there. And when it's not, we call it link rod. Today's web also lacks a transparent change log. Without a transparent change log, we visit a URL and we hope the thing that we want hasn't changed. And if it has changed, we hope someone left us a note. And that doesn't always happen. When we can tell that content has changed, we call it content drift. Today's web also lacks links between silos. That means the same information can exist in multiple places. We don't have a good way of saying, like, this is the authoritative copy, and um, we're not able to use the redundancy there to the, uh, what am I trying to say? We have no benefits of that redundancy. We just have a lot of redundancy. And these issues relate to decisions that were made about how the web works that were made 15 to 20 years ago. And technology has changed a lot. Today, the internet, the web, is being reimagined by the decentralized web community. It's exploring new protocols, new approaches. It's being reimagined as a place where users can freely share data without centralized control, where, where objects that live on the web are persistent. And for scholars, librarians, and archivists, this is a chance to step back, see what are the assumptions that are baked into the core technologies that we use? Are these the values that we care about? Where can we change? So as these community-driven approaches come up, there's the potential to change the way that data are shared, stored, and accessed. New technologies make this more possible, but the time to center our values is now. So I talked a little bit about DAT in the beginning. It's one of our sponsored projects. What is it? It's a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocol. Definitely nobody in this room has ever downloaded anything from the Pirate Bay using BitTorrent. So you wouldn't maybe have any experience with peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocols. But the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocols like BitTorrent um, have matured a lot in the last 15 to 20 years. And they're now powerful file sharing uh, decentralized network building systems. So what is DAT? Essentially, it's a system where when you start tracking a package of data with DAT, it creates a persistent identifier for that package of data and an append-only log for that folder. You can then share that folder across a network. So if you look at these little blue dots, we can imagine one of them is the original blue dot. The data is viewable by others in the network, and a couple of people can collect a copy. But that original, that co those copies link back to the original with a persistent <coughs> identifier and an append-only log, and the other folks don't make changes, can't make changes. So DAT is good. So again, persistent identifiers plus an append-only log over a network of peers, no blockchain. <laughs> it's my laugh line. <laughs> Woo. So what is it good for? It's good for handling and versioning large files, automating data sharing, uh, using the capacity of the network to scale. So the more copies that exist in a network, the more storage the network has. The, larger, the more nodes, the more storage. Yes, this is starting to sound like utopian tech solutionism. By the way, I rewatched Jurassic Park. Did you know the entire plot hinges on scientists so desperate for funding that they would go to that island with this guy? <laughs> really puts another spin on the whole thing. Um, but I promise you, <laughs> this project is a people project. It is not really a tech project. So DAT was originally developed for scientific data sharing. For the last year, we've been working with California Digital Library's UC3 Curation Center, funded by Gordon and Betty Moore, to explore how embedding a DAT developer in a University of California research group, or actually five, as it turned out, <laughs> would allow us to build tools that fix problems for researchers by leveraging the properties of the DAT protocol, automated versioning, automated data sharing, building private networks. So we were working on that project. We learned a lot about what researchers want, and I'm gonna gloss over a year of work here because this is a short talk. Uh, we worked directly with the scientists to understand their workflows. This is Dr. Denise Reyes Ramos, who's describing the C-STAR genome, genome annotation pipeline, which is a bunch of analysis scripts plugged together. There's an XK, XKCD about pipelines. Um, everyone uses them. They're always, it's always kind of a disaster. They're hard to replicate. And uh, the issue that she was having was that she had spent four months trying to replicate a pipeline that had been developed at UCLA and get it to run at Merced. So we worked with her on that, and I'm gonna gloss it over because what I wanna talk about 
is all the stuff we learned while we were doing that. We learned what researchers want because they told us. They want to easily share and version data sets. And here, again, everything is data. So we're talking about raw data, test data, analyzed data, the pipelines, the compute environments, all the software dependencies, the papers, the whole thing. They want their work to be preserved in a usable form, and more importantly, or more importantly to them, they want their colleagues' work to be preserved in a usable form so they don't need to kill four months trying to replicate something on a different campus. Um, they want to know how their work is being used, so data preservation with use metrics is very important to these researchers because that's how they demonstrate the value of their work to their institutions and their funders. And they need all of this to happen at a low cost with a high trust institution. Because of the way that grant cycles work, researchers are not able to bill the NIH five years after a grant has run out for the preservation and keeping those data online. So they want this stuff preserved, but it needs to be low cost, long term preservation. We, who were working on the project, the developers, the technologists, and the librarians, we brought our own set of needs. And as we were talking to them, we started thinking, can we give them everything they want by building a decentralized network where when data is ready to be released, it's released to the network and stored in multiple places? What would that look like? So what does a decentralized scholarly commons look like? This is what we're trying to build. We believe it should be a community-driven network built with partners. I'm not interested in building a new platform that everyone needs to ditch all their old platforms and like come swim to my island. I think that's a waste of time. I want to build things that link existing institutions, and I want to build things that are designed for long-term preservation and access, not 10 years, more like 50 years, or forever, as the Internet Archive likes to say. We want we see we can give researchers what they want, sharing and preservation of usable data packages, low cost and high trust, with a DAT network built in partnership with researchers and libraries that's designed for low, lo, long-term, low-cost access and preservation. We want to bake open access in to the technology so you cannot paywall it. Um, so with all this in mind, here's our approach. Our approach is to link the existing infrastructure of trusted institutions to form a network of core nodes and build a scholarly commons this way by linking silos. Now I'm going to walk you through um, what an example of what this will look like, and then I will tell you what we have actually built. So how would this work? In this example, the Dawson Lab at Merced has a set of methods, data, analysis processes, and results possibly linked to a publication, possibly not. They're ready to make it public. They share it with their local institution, Merced. And now the Dawson Lab and Merced have a copy. Because Merced participates in a wider network, when the new object is, is collected by Merced, the rest of the network gets a ping. And anyone in the network who has a mandate to collect that type of information um, in this example, UC3 collects the work of U University of California researchers. The Internet Archive collects everything. Go Internet Archive. And uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center collects genomic data sets. So these three institutions have a mandate to collect this type of data. They pull it down. And now, from the Dawson Lab's perspective, five copies of this work exist. They're all usable, accessible copies. There's no dark archives. Each institution is only paying for one copy of this work to be preserved. And the Dawson Lab knows that there are five copies held at trusted entities, so they're with commitments to long-term preservation, so their concerns about storage costs are reduced. Now, but what the Dawson Lab really wants is for people to use their work. So that's why they're, that's why they're making it available. So when the Genomics Consortium takes a copy to take that pipeline and take the parts of it that work for them and re remake it, the Dawson Lab can see that activity, say, OK, Genomics Consortium has taken a copy. I wonder what they're going to do with it. We can, they can, it can be a way to talk to them, just a way to record that this work is being, you know, the work that was funded by this grant is being used in this way. Genomics Consortium makes some changes, releases their own version, and they can share that back from the network to the network. And that can also be collected. In this case, it's only collected by the organizations that care about that kind of work. Merced doesn't have a mandate to collect all the work from the UC. They don't have to collect a copy unless it becomes frequently used by Merced researchers. Maybe then they choose to collect a copy. I hope this kind of explains what I'm talking about with the decentralized network. 
in a decentralized network, these trusted institutions are linked at a foundational level. They share information about their collections and can choose to take copies of assets that are either frequently used in, in their purview of things that they should be collecting or want to be collecting. And in this way, they're quite literally supporting each other because each one only needs to hold and pay for the storage of one, but they get the power of multiple, inst multiple trusted institutions in a network. Does that make sense, hopefully? So what are we uh, actually building? We're building this prototype to share data across the scholarly network. And kind of what we're really doing is trying to understand what does collaborative infrastructure look like when we're using decentralized protocol technologies? What are the institutional barriers that we're going to face? There's a lot of troubleshooting to be done. There are commercial offerings that institutions can buy that might solve problems like this today. Maybe they're easy to use. But the long-term costs and trade-offs, from my perspective, especially around data ownership, are unclear. So we want to make something that will be lower cost long-term, leverages existing infrastructure, and locks scholarly content open forever. So prototype status. We took um, University of Calif California Digital Library's UC3 Dash data set. Uh, we took a snapshot of it. It is less than a terabyte, not actually that big. And we copied it to three places, and now we're working on handling uncertainty. So adding extra nodes, adding nodes that are unstable, and um, troubleshooting the system. So in this model, every institution contributes storage and bandwidth, metadata on their collection, and a commitment to preserve their collection. That's what an institution commits when they join the network. Any user can access, and that's any person, they do not need to be affiliated with an institution, can access metadata on collections, history of objects, and whole or partial data sets from the network. So Dat in the Lab just wrapped up. We're working on long-term stewardship of the scholarly work, which is a problem that you crack with people, not a new protocol. Dat gives us the opportunity to build tools take new approaches, but that's only interesting if we can use those new approaches to center the needs of humans, the people that create the work, the people who steward the work, the institutions that commit, and uh, the people who will use it. So it's really not a technology problem. This is institutions plus people plus commitments. The software, frankly, is the easy part. There is no technology that can guarantee the long-term stewardship of scholarly work. Only people can do that. And this project is about people. This is my... Malcolm slide, <laughs> um, about using existing infrastructure, linking trusted in institutions, and building things that can handle the chaos and uncertainty that humans invariably bring to every situation. So who are the people? This is the Data in the Lab stakeholders convening, a group of scientists, librarians, and technologists met last month to discuss everyone's needs, everyone's priorities, and the concept of a cooperative data preservation network it was a great meeting. You can tell from everyone's smiling faces. And um, this talk is about done. So as we head into the questions, I'd like to leave you with a question. What's important to you? If we were to reimagine how data and scholarship live on the web, how these things are handled by technology, what would you prioritize? Because now is the time to do that. We have new tools. We can do this in a way we have not been able to do it before. So what do you care about? Is it limiting the monetization of scholarly work? Is it removing barriers to access? Is it something else? Is it long-term, long-term sustainability, like geological time long-term? Let me know. Uh, I'll be excited to hear your comments in the question period. And I want to thank the Dat in the Lab participants and the FORCE organizing and program committees for all their hard work on this amazing conference. You can find me online very easily. And that's the end. Oh, and there's a million links if you want to read them to learn more about this project. I will post the slides. I was fiddling with them until the last minute. So I will post the slides, and these links can all be clicked on from there. So thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Such an interesting presentation you did. Uh, do you have questions here? I see two. Yes. Thank you very much. It was great. How much do you see funders as part of this decentralized network? 
I see funders as a big part of the kickoff of this. What we need is human time, <laughs> people hours, to uh, work through the prototyping and development. As I mentioned in the beginning, DAT is a nonprofit grant-funded entity. DAT is not able to like take venture capital investment. It is not able to be sold or acquired. Um, but because of that, we're a small team. And so we love working with the CDL team, and they have software developers there. But um, to take the prototype to the next level, I think that we will need funder, uh, well, we will need funder money. But we will also appreciate the support of funders. Uh, I suppose I was thinking, actually, uh, as funders as part of that infrastructure and network, because they grants, uh, grant proposals, all of that data yeah, absolutely. also needs to, this, absolutely. They need to be into the system. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, one of my colleagues, Jonathan Kane at the University of Oregon, um, is doing a really interesting project collecting information on funders and, and grant, like where grants are going and stuff. And I, I, I don't see this type of a network can be joined by anyone. So he's at the University of Oregon. If that institution wants to participate, or if he himself or a funder wants to share data to the network, in, in this model, it would be copied by the Internet Archive, San Diego Supercomputer Center, California Digital Library, and any other members who are interested in that information. So yes, but we also need money. Like, is that wrong to say? That's just, that's just reality. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, yeah. yeah, so I have a question about, about DAT. Um, so there are parts of the, the re research workflow where the data shouldn't be public or maybe is not ready to be public, or um, is there thought, or maybe it's already implemented, of adding something like private key encryption yeah, to the so DAT protocol? Yes, so DAT is um, encrypted. The way that the protocol works now, it's a private network by default. Um, and as I say that, I want to caveat, there is more work to be done, and we are doing a security audit currently, so I'm not going to say, like, yes, internet freedom activists should all go and use DAT. But for we have worked with clinical trials and built private DAT networks for other folks who need data to be private. So the way that it works now, you could build a data sharing network for your research group. And then when you're ready to share something to the wider network, um, you can do that. So. Oh, okay. so, so, oh yeah, it, it's always changing, man. Yeah. Got to say. And there's this new thing called multi-writer that's coming, and that's going to change everything again. Um, but we have open protocol working groups, if you're ever curious. And we also run a community call quarterly, where DAT will give an update on the latest development stuff. So yeah, open source, always changing. Yes, OK. Hi, I'm Sarvan. Hello? <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarvan. Hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And my question is, what is the smallest unit of information you can represent? Uh, for example, like, can you have a profile identifier? Can you have a hypothesis yeah. identifier? I don't mean the, the application hypothesis. Yeah. I mean, like, um, method, uh, method, you know, f five or something or whatever. So DAT handles information in a folder system. So anything that can go in a folder can be datified. There are There is a chat application called Cabal, which is built on DAT. And there's also a Twitter clone called Fritter, which is built on DAT. And those are just essentially like profiles and uh, JSON files of like whatever people, I think they call it fretting when they work on them instead of tweeting. Um, so uh, there's no lower limit uh, that I'm aware of. Upper limit is going to be dictated by your bandwidth. So like theoretically, there's no upper limit either, but like you'll, you can find one if you, if you try. Um, how do you represent, so how would you represent? I might not be understanding your question, but what I would, 
Yeah, we can talk later. I think you would just put it, put an, a link to something else or an identifier in a JSON file or another type of text file. And that could be in a data archive. Have you had have you had any um, thoughts on how to leverage this approach into other kinds of scholarly objects? I'm thinking in particular about publications. Thinking about what? Uh, research publications. Sure. So uh, the way I think of it is that everything is data, and so I think of publications as a part of the scholarly commons. I think that the distinction between publications and data is kind of artificial because it's all at this point accessed online and it's handled by web protocols in one way or the other. So um, what I, what the way that I conceive of the scholarly common, decentralized scholarly commons idea is a place for all of it, for figures, for micro publications, for data, the whole thing. Hi. Um, so do you plan on either working with, or like developing on Solid or working with Inrupt? as like a funder, I guess? So since I don't know what either of those things are, okay. <laughs> I can't answer your question. <laughs> uh, we, we can talk about this later also. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm th thinking out loud here, but as we think at Protocols.io about mirroring protocols that we have, when it's just a PDF text, it's fairly straightforward, but we're starting to see more and more people embedding videos, right? Video instructions, so the type of media. Um, sometimes it's a link to YouTube, which may or may not be there in 20 years. Sometimes it's a video file that gets uploaded. How do we handle mirroring of that kind of content? I don't have an answer to it. Yeah, um, it's, so a, it's something from, we are struggling with. So from DAT's perspective, DAT is sort of because it's just a protocol, it doesn't care what you're moving, what kind of information you're sharing. We are working a little bit with the project Web Recorder, which is a really interesting um, web archiving project on, and they deal a, a lot with people who are self-archiving their YouTube video content. So we will certainly like learn a lot from that collaboration, but we don't have, um, you know, there, there, there is a baked-in versioning that happens. So if you have the video file attached, um, even if the original, the video link dies, if the video file is in the DAT, you'll be okay. But um, yeah, so that's my answer to that question. So DAT doesn't care, and there are probably ways to make sure that you could collect all of the relevant content. But dead links, dead links are everyone's problem. <laughs> Two more minutes, I think, or something. Is there any thought to building like a citation or reference thing into the protocol, or is that beyond the so, goals? So um, some of the other projects that we work with, one of our other sponsored projects is this um, thing called Science Fair, which is more of a publication library. And that project could, in theory, integrate with like eLife's reproducible document stack and some other um, ways to build in citations. We're not personally interested in reinventing the citation wheel. We would like to collaborate with folks who are already doing that work. So. Um, curious, I love the DAT protocol. I'm curious about the discoverability angle. I don't know if that's at all something. Yeah, we think about that a lot. Um, and because we're so this is all happening, and my, I have a PhD in neuroscience, so my interest is scholarship and reproducibility and all that stuff. There's a whole other part of the DAT community that is interested in building new social networks. And so it's, it's cool because we get to, the way that that works now is that people build crawlers that crawl, crawl out um, on you know, dat.json files and figure out what's in the network. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done in that area. So, yeah, let's talk. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, thank you all. Uh, now we'll end the session. Thank you, Daniela. And right. uh, we'll have a morning break and back in 11. Thank, thank you, you everybody. So